I am your maven of the eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews in Space! Ooh. In 1985, Canon Films released the movie Life Force. Now, if you've never heard of Canon Films, it's because they're not around anymore. No, they crashed and burned hard. Not long after this film, in fact. You see, Canon had a bit of a reputation. They actually started with porn flicks, but became best known for producing piles and piles of schlocky B-movies. Exploitation films, Rambo ripoffs, a lot of Chuck Norris, and heaps of low-budget pulp and sci-fi. Quantity over quality. They put out 43 films in 1986, but while they were working on those, apparently, they had dreams. Big dreams! They wanted to break into the mainstream with a huge Hollywood blockbuster type of film. They wanted it so bad! And though it was a UK project, they hired Toby Hooper, the American director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist, handed him $25 million, their biggest budget yet, and a book, and told him to run wild. This book was Colin Wilson's 1976 novel, The Space Vampires. Yes, that is literally what it is called. So the film Canon hoped would be their mainstream international blockbuster to transcend their schlocky B-movie reputation was not only a vampire film, but vampires in space. Things did not go well. Much of that huge budget went to special effects, and the film did win awards for those, even if some were blatant Ghostbusters ripoffs. But it ran out of money, and the production had to make sacrifices, and was even put on hiatus at one point. Apparently, several key scenes were not even able to be filmed, so the story suffered. The end result was a truly redonkulous film, a mishmash of genres that was all over the place, took itself way too seriously, and felt nothing like the mainstream fair canon hoped for. I mean, what were they expecting? The space vampires was what they chose. This was a bad plan. The film was a financial disaster, though it did find something of a cult following in the years that followed. There are those who enjoy it for its so bad its amazing qualities, or as a guilty pleasure, or even some hard-hitting sci-fi scholars who genuinely find it incredible. C.J. Henderson called it the most intelligent vampire film ever made, a true thinking sci-fi fans film. Sure, Jan. But, uh, let's not beat around the bush. The real reason most people remember this movie? The main vampire spends almost all of her screen time 100% nude. Oh yeah, just the thing to help escape that exploitation B-movie reputation canon. Good thinking there. We can't much blame director Toby Hooper for this. It was in the script, and he's quoted complaining about the filming challenges the nudity caused. Really, Hooper was there to run amok with special effects and indulge in his dreams of creating something that captured a classic hammer horror aesthetic. Something huge and epic. And I can definitely see the Hammer Studios' influences where the vampire is concerned. Compared to the glossier US vampire movies Universal Studios put out back in the day, the UK Hammer films were darker, gorier, and more erotic. While still maintaining an air of sophistication, Americans like to associate with Britishness. But when Hooper finished his edit of the movie, Canon was not pleased. They'd already changed the name of the film from The Space Vampires to Life Force in an effort to elevate their image. But they decided that vampires in general were too schlocky for their mainstream dreams. <laughs> they recut the film, deleting almost half an hour, including most of the references to vampires. This is the theatrical cut that came out in the US in 1985. It is a disjointed mess and bombed at the box office. Nowadays, it's easy to find the director's cut, which still isn't a good movie, but at least it's actually a vampire movie. So that's what we're going to focus on. So space vampires, okay. The story goes that astronauts find an alien ship riding along with Halley's Comet. They discover it's full of gruesome, hideous, dead bat creatures and three sleeping human-looking aliens 
who are buck-ass naked. They decide to take the hot ones back to Earth, but turns out they're vampires who suck the life force out of humans in effort to revive their species. They send this energy back up to their ship, which is also kind of alive, and start a chain reaction as each human they drain goes on to drain others. Chaos seizes London, and the one surviving astronaut and his military colonel buddy have to track down the escaped vampire leader before she and her backup dancer boys can drain the whole world. The main vampires, played by teenager Tilda May, and she doesn't have a name. She's referred to as the Space Girl, and she is completely alien. Here's a take on vampires we haven't discussed often. You know how much I like to focus on vampires as characters and their reflection of human nature. But the Space Girl is not a character. She is a force. She is the anthropomorphized representation of the sheer force of vampiric nature itself as are her two psychics who act as extensions of her. They're a hive species. The ship itself is the nexus and these vampires and perhaps all the others who died in bat form before them are merely ancillaries for its central mind, such as it were, with no more individual personalities than bees or ants, not people at all. But this take on the vampire is still a metaphor for humanity. The crux of the film is summed up by this convenient death scientist who serves as the Van Helsing-style exposition fairy. I mean, in a sense, we're all vampires. We drain energy from other life forms. The difference is one of degree. Yeah, when they cut this line from the theatrical release, the film kind of lost its point. So, as all living creatures on Earth exist through the exchange of energy, yes, we are, in a sense, all vampires. But what sets humans apart is that they are conscious of it. They are not hive mind drones. They can make choices about how they express their inescapable vampiric tendencies. And do. And this applies to more than just eating things. The uh, less literal, more symbolic vampirism is the important part here. Humans especially can be vampiric in the way they use and abuse other people, both on an individual and mass level. The message here is to stop and think about it. Make the right choices. Draining energy from others is unavoidable, but how can you, as a human, minimize the evil of it? What did that scholar nerd guy say? A true thinking sci-fi fans film? Yeah, well, think about it. The Van Helsing alike here is not the only Dracula reference in this film. There's actually quite a few of them. After the vampires are taken aboard the British spaceship, they start killing the sailors, I mean astronauts, one by one, so that when the humans find it, it's a ship of the dead, just like when the Demeter crash lands in Dracula. The space girl does an energy exchange with the main astronaut Carlson that gives them a psychic link similar to Dracula exchanging blood with Mina. Van Helsing uses Mina's connection to track Dracula's whereabouts, drawing out the information through hypnosis just as they do with Carlson to find the space girl and discover her plans. Of course, there's the plague that sweeps London and the obvious gender flip Dracula's brides. And as the vampire ship rides Halley's Comet, it passes Earth every 75 years or so. So these aliens past visitations are credited with providing all the world's history of vampire lore. They visited Earth before. I had fun spotting this stuff while watching the movie, but I can't decide whether it serves as nerdy homages or lazy shortcuts. See, most of it wasn't in Colin Wilson's novel at all. He actually wrote the book as part of a challenge to out Lovecraft H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that. And he hated the film adaptation of his novel. The words worst movie ever made were tossed around, but you see, Toby Hooper was a Hammer Horror fanboy and just over the moon about having the budget to make a film in that style. Quartermass in the Pit was a big visual influence for the destruction of London, but when it comes to the vampire stuff, Life Force is rife with the tropes canonized by Hammer's Dracula and Carmilla series. Wilson made a point to avoid such vampire cliches in his book, so it's no wonder he was pissed off his originality was diminished by the filmmakers tossing in things that were vampire-y for the sake of it. Cause, you know, space vampires are serious artistic business. Poor Wilson. But the one vampire trope, which was a chief part of Stoker's Dracula that is present in all here, is the xenophobic metaphor of the vampire as a terrifying foreigner with heathen ways, coming to English shores.
powers to corrupt the cultured, sophisticated British society. Those swarthy foreign deviants, whether they're from the stars or Eastern Europe, it's, it's always the same. Corrupting proper English folk. You'd think the film might be marginally more progressive as the vampire is female this time and it's not innocent maiden victims being made examples of but hot-blooded men. But in the true Hammer Studios lesbian vampire tradition, she makes no distinction about which gender she targets. Not just the British thing, of course. Classic Hollywood was just as guilty of sparking those stereotypes with the casting of foreign-looking people as monsters. There's Bella Lugosi, obviously, and Boris Karloff, who was of Indian descent. And in this film, Matilda May is often credited with being able to deliver such an eerie performance due to her foreignness. You see, she was a French dancer from Paris who was cast after the production completely exhausted every available actress in England and some of Germany. They reportedly went through over a thousand actresses before they were able to find one they liked who was willing to do the extensive nudity the script demanded. I've been in space for six months and she looks perfect to me. There's quite a meshing of British and American sensibilities in the film, but the big vampire metaphor that shines through from both cultures is sex. Back to our all living things are vampiric point. Humans draining others of energy in malicious ways is bad enough, but when they do so in sexually abusive ways, that's just scandalous and horrifying. It starts with the vampire ship that looks way too much like a veiny penis on the outside, but also has distinctly vaginal and womb-like imagery on the inside. And this ship is alive, throbbing. They say they modeled it after an artichoke, but you know what this really looks like to me? A vampire squid. Seriously, look at it. That, that's a vampire squid. That's kind of awesome. Then, not only is the vampire a generally gorgeous naked woman, she also has this aura of sex appeal. The movie doesn't exactly describe whether it's a pheromone thing or a hypnosis thing, just that it's this presence. It's the most overwhelmingly feminine presence I've ever encountered. I was drawn to her on a level that... Was it sexual? Yes, overwhelmingly so. And horrible. This invisible seductive quality, though, is a difficult thing to convey on film without silly effects, and results in a lot of men just kind of staring at her for long takes. So her nudity serves as the representation for the audience of this power of allure that the characters keep talking about but we can't see or feel. Confident nudity has long been used as a symbol of power. Someone who is not afraid of displaying their body is even threatening to many people. And it also serves to emphasize the vampire's alienness, as she, of course, has no concept of Earth's sense of shame. However, these ideas are completely lost on most of the audience. And ultimately, that result carries a lot more weight than any supposed artistic intentions. Like I said, this movie is best remembered for teenage space vampire full frontal titillation, not its depth. And that's not the audience's fault. In the book, the vampire's true forms are pure energy, but they take on the bat alien shape for reasons. The film doesn't get into that, but it does explain that the reason they took on human forms when the astronauts find them is because that's how they lure them in. The space girl explains to Carlson that she took her form from his mind's idea of the perfect woman. And this, combined with the energy they exchanged, is why he's so obsessed with her. She's able to body hop into her victims, including Patrick Stewart. But she always comes back to Matilda May's body when Carlson is involved. I knew you would come, Carlson. At least she eventually finds some clothes. But even though she and Carlson share this bond, it still does nothing to give her an identity of her own. As a vampire, she never becomes a character, a person. She has no wants or needs other than to consume energy for the sake of furthering her species. She is a mouthpiece for her penis ship overlord of pure vampiric nature, and a symbol of Carlson's vulnerability as a man. This was Sir Patrick Stewart's first on-screen kiss, by the way. Even though his part isn't much more than a cameo and he spends much of it unconscious, he actually has twice as much screen time as Matilda May. At the end, Carlson figures out that the space girl needs back the energy she gave him, for reasons. And then somehow this means he's now a vampire too? You're one of us. You always have been. You're like me. He's got to defeat her by 
mating with her and sacrificing himself, he beams back to the ship with her, and even though she's gone now, the ship is energized. And who knows what will happen when it returns with Halley's Comet in 76 years? Though it's unclear if this is enough to stop the ravaging infected swarming over London, so maybe the world's already doomed? And is he giving her what she wants or resisting? Or... Yeah, the ending is a serious mess. None of the Halley's Comet stuff was in the book either, by the way. The vampire ship was just hanging out in the asteroid belt. It was actually Toby Hooper's idea to add that bit in, as the comet was passing Earth in 1986, a year after the movie was released, and there was a lot of hype about it at the time. But the cyclical nature of man being seduced into his own doom and not learning from the past is a fun idea to explore, so more comet, I say. When the space vampires drain humans of their life force, those humans become vampires as well. If they don't drain another human of their life force within two hours, their desiccated bodies explode into dust. It's completely desiccated. Now, desiccated is an interesting word here. Besides the bodies becoming shriveled and drained of moisture in the literal definition, though what their life force energy has to do with moisture, I'm not sure, the word has another official definition that is lacking interest, passion, or energy. Yeah, that's a metaphorical parallel to the moisture draining definition, but it's also literally true of the vampire victims. Like the aliens, the human vampires lose all aspects of their personalities, becoming mindless forces of hunger. Much more like cinema zombies than the complex emotional vampires I prefer, but I'd say if we're going to start playing the monster hierarchy arbitrary semantic definition game, these dried out husk vampires are more mummies than zombies. The filmmakers even refer to the alien ship as the pyramid chamber and to the pods holding the vampires as crystal sarcophagi. And this connects them even more to the xenophobia metaphors tied into British and American history of fetishizing ancient Egyptian culture, especially surrounding death and immortality. The vampire, as a lens to examine Western fear of the other, is often all tangled up in fetishization. Foreigners are scary, but also alluring, exotic, dangerous, taboo, and that makes them hot. But don't let your mom find out you're into that. So shameful. In many ways, the other, as a literary metaphor, can be boiled down to just sex. In repressed white Western culture, sex is so stigmatized that it is itself an other. Life force doesn't become about any particular foreign culture to fear, but the fear of sexuality itself. Fear of its threat to take over, consume, and transform people through what is masked as pleasure. Transform for the horrifying. The aura of allure the space girl emits robs men of their ability to consent. But this suggests that any sense of natural desire one might feel is likewise a loss of one's will. That to feel desire at all is to fall victim to the vampiric nature that, as we said, is in all things. Beware. But if anyone came away from this film filled with the insight that, well, repression and total self-control are the only answer to individual freedom, I would be highly surprised. No. They came out of it all. <laughs> Space boobs. And really, that's probably for the best. Because fetishizing the other is bad enough, but dictating a moral of sexuality of any kind deserving punishment is even worse. So true thinking sci-fi fans film? Well, there sure is a lot to think about. I'm just not sure that I want to. Ultimately, Life Force was just too pretentious with its ambitions of being a Hollywood mainstream epic blockbuster. Instead of doing something new to transcend canon film's B-movie reputation, it just tried to elevate pulp to artsy, deep heights. And also, pro tip, meshing four different genres into one movie is not a way to get crossover appeal. It's just going to alienate all your target audiences with the bait and switch. I almost had the feeling I've been here before. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and Halley's Comet is coming back in 2061, and yeah, I'll still be here. Choose me next time, my space queen! Thanks 
so much for watching my video. This one was actually another request from one of my Patreon patrons. So if you want someone to blame for Life Force showing up on the show, it's not my fault. You should join my Patreon so you can go have words with him. And thank you so much to all my Patreon patrons and to everyone who watches my videos. Please like, subscribe, comment, follow me on Twitter and Facebook because without you guys, I would be so lonely.